Okay, so welcome. Yeah, it's fantastic to be over here in Canada. It's really nice and exciting to actually be somewhere new, actually involving and talking to people that I generally don't know about the agriculture within Canada, generally. So it's nice to learn some new things. Now, you've got to imagine that we do things a little bit differently over in England, and I'm not an agricultural specialist. My background is robotics. So, if you have any specific questions about agriculture and all those things, probably not the best person to ask, but I can hold my own. So, let's get started. Yep, yeah, that's me, all nice suited and booted, ready to actually have a nice chat for you, all the way over from the UK. It's nice to actually be here, and it's really good to actually showcase the technologies that I've actually been working on, actually showing off um, what we've been doing in the UK. Um, I look nicely dressed, but generally, I'm kapow. Is it going to work? There we go. I wear shorts and t-shirts, flying drones, everything else. I'm a big geek, generally, just to actually make sure that um, whatever I actually do works. Um, I love drones, I love all the technology about them, and I've got a bit of enthusiasm about it all. And I'm a bit of a different person. I can talk geek, but I can also generally have a conversation with a normal person as well, which is quite nice. And that's probably what managed to pit me to actually get a Nuffield Scholarship this year, really allowing me to actually just stand up above the crowd. So, I graduated in 2005 with Robotics Automated Systems, allowing me to actually um, do certain things with robots, programming, electronics, I'm a kind of middle grounder. I'm certainly able to understand everything else across the board, but it allows me to actually put things together and make things work. And that's kind of what dragged me into the North Sea for six and a half years. And that allowed me to understand technology that really needed to work. If there was any problems, you had to solve it there and then without any backup, and you had to make it work every single time. So with that kind of capability, I wanted to actually make sure I was able to bring that back into the industry of agriculture. Yeah, so I'm a fully qualified drone pilot. I like flying drones and everything else. And despite the young appearance, thanks, um, I've uh, got 13 years experience of actually working on drone systems. Okay, so a few years experience. That's me when I'm nine. I love planes. I love drones. I love their capabilities to actually do certain things for me. And I have a nice large drone that allows me to actually do certain things. And I started a company called HiOBS a number of years ago thinking that I could actually solve all of agricultural's problems with a drone. Oh boy, was I wrong. But this allows me to actually understand certain things about agriculture and how I can actually use drone systems to actually help us actually work. Right, so where is Harper Adams? I've put London on there because everybody seems to understand that London is a place in England. We are a little small island, and up a little bit north and over to the west side, we actually have a place called Harper Adams, a very small, sleepy, little university. We only have about 3,000 students there per annum. And as you can see, nice aerial photograph of the university there. It is a very interesting place that allows everybody to actually get involved within agriculture and actually understand all the main key aspects of it. Okay, so about us. So I'm from Harper Adams University. I'm a researcher there. I went there mainly because well, not merely because I'm an academic, mainly because I wanted to actually find out more. I am just keen to find out everything about every single day, knowledge, how you can actually work that to what you want to do. Agriculture seemed to be a good place to actually go because it allowed me to live where I work. I'd spent six and a half years out in the middle of the North Sea. It was quite miserable and I'd missed green. So I decided to actually come all the way back to the land and actually work for places that do good things for all our food. So, Harper Adams is an engineering and agriculture, agribusiness, food, land-based studies, and is the home of the National Centre of Precision Farming, the department that I actually work for. Um, with that, I met my work colleague, Kit Franklin. Very, very good lad, and we actually really work together, work together well, enabling ourselves to actually do certain different things and think out the box, which is quite a unique perspective, certainly within agriculture, which can be down, well, how it's done all the time. And then we've got another person who actually joined the project for the Hands Free Hectare. He was an old student from Harper Adams, so we knew him well. And they work with Precision Decisions to actually have the specific GPS RTK control systems that we needed for our tractor system that we knew we'd need to do. 
But once again, I didn't have the specialized capability of actually working with those systems, so we thought it was best to get a partner to enable us to actually do that. And Precision Decisions and Clive Blacker, very, very forward-thinking company allowing us to actually do something that nobody else thought was possible at the moment. So there's the likely lads, me in the center. Martin's the blonde lad on the, um, well, the right-hand side for me. And Kit, the gentleman in the red trousers, is a very good lecture indeed. Okay, so, hands-free Hector, that's what I'm here to talk about, a world's first. We wanted to break down perceptions of what could actually be done with agricultural technology. I've been working with drone systems for many years, and I wanted to actually make sure that that understanding could actually be transferred and do something completely unique and special and break down the barriers of what the large companies like John Deere, Case New Holland, Class, all these other companies were actually showing they had got the capability of doing, but weren't releasing to us, the public, to actually make sure that well, we could actually work in a different way. So the project outline was to actually automate machines growing the first arable crop with our operators in the driving seats or agronomists on the ground. So the entire idea was to actually make sure that we didn't get into that hectare. So we've got a nice layout of what the hectare was. We tried to make it as perfect as possible. Now, in the UK, our fields aren't regular and square and everything. Now, that might be slightly different over here. You've got a little bit more land. But one hectare was a perfect area to enable us to actually do certain things. Now, the green area around the outside was a headland turn area. We didn't want to make it too difficult for ourselves because, once again, we knew it was going to be setting ourselves for a challenge in the first place. The idea was to have 100 by 100 square, allowing us to actually do all our automation in the central brown square, allowing us to go up and down with small passes of small machinery, enabling us to actually work this entire field without us actually physically getting onto the vehicle. So going into that, we set ourselves the challenge. World's first automated field grown, drilling the husbandry and the agronomy, including a harvest. Now, everybody knows that a combine harvest is quite scary from the front. I did really want to make sure that we did this correctly and make sure it was nice and safe at the very end of it, because once again, we were quite scared that it actually could go wrong. Um, challenge and perception of automation. Everybody thinks it's really, really difficult, and it's way off into the future. Now, I've been working with drone technology for many years, and I just wanted to really show that the capabilities were there now. So therefore, what we did was actually use real open source technology that we could buy on the internet, download from open source communities from the drone environment, and actually add that to the realistic environment of actually working in a field. So therefore, that's what we completely planned out to do. So this is capable for everybody in the seats for you to actually achieve. It is not really difficult. Okay, it's pretty difficult because nobody else has done it before, but if you've got the specialities like myself, you can actually break down these barriers and actually show that it's not these larger companies that will actually have to lead the way. You can actually start punching well above your weight. Now, there was one big thing. We'd got one year and we had one chance to do it. So therefore, that allowed us to only do a spring crop and we had to develop the tractor in very quick succession. So, well, that's what we did. Now, first of all, we knew this was going to be a big challenge. We wanted to make sure we had the right partners on board to actually enable us to actually work with a set system. Now, I know that a number of these companies will not actually be applicable over here in Canada, but you might recognize a few of the names. But all of them actually had their specific role to play. So Bayer with a com chemical company allowing us to actually have the certain chemicals we'd treat the field. Yara, uh, nitrogen, certain amounts. Um, KWS, our seed, they provided our specific seed they're allowed to actually work with. Pepple and Fuchs, they provided the laser safety system that we were able to work with. Linac, they were the actuators. We could not actuate anything without these physical systems, therefore we had to get a partner to help us along the way. Hutchinson's our agronomist. Our agronomist was provided a very forward-thinking farmer who had actually come into agronomy and enabled us to actually work together and actually think, how could we actually do agronomy on a farm that generally would involve a physical person to get into the ground and work on? And then we've got Izeki. Izeki was the largest company and helper of this particular project because they provided the tractor that we would use every single day. Now, I like props, but unfortunately, my hand luggage will not allow me to bring a tractor over here today. So we'll have to cope with pictures, unfortunately. 
But it's really nice to actually see these certain things all come together in one separate package. So field robotics, why are we actually trying to do this breakdown of perception? So current ag problems that we actually have at the moment is that we've got limited time windows. So ever and ever larger machines tend to get developed, allowing us to actually get onto the land. Reduced rural labor. So therefore, we've only got one person to do it. So a larger machine would actually help us actually do all that work over the area. This does have some problems. So it's got compaction. This compaction can reduce yield and actually limit our growth. Well, this is a bad thing. How do we actually think about changing this up? Well, there is the small robot solution, as you've maybe seen, the, the Mars robot, which is actually done by um, uh, Kubota, which have actually got their system there. Um, they're intending to run systems together in swarms. Very interesting idea. I don't necessarily believe that that particular system will be on the market soon, mainly because it still involves another tractor to actually till the field beforehand. So therefore, we need to think about some other ways of doing it. Well, thinking back all way back when, Anybody remember the old Greg Fergies? Or old tractors, small, about 50 horsepower, anything around there? Everybody asleep? Nod some heads if everybody had an old tractor. Yeah, I'm sure everybody did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So everybody knows that you can actually work this land out there and actually make sure it really does the job that you need to. So we're not breaking some ground rules of actually going back to smaller machines, but if you have an automated system that runs on a machine that size, well, you can still work the land, and you just need to have somebody to control that particular system. This has some amazing benefits. You've got reduced compaction. We never had compaction problems back in the 1950s because we were running on smaller and smaller machines. Therefore, this allowed us to actually, well, unfortunately, damage our agricultural process. We've got improved resolution because you've got a smaller particular machine. That allows us to actually have a margin gain, allow you to actually understand that. Well, you can run them together in swarms, still cover the same area. All of this system can actually work together, and this is how we actually did it with our smaller machine. So, ag problems, I love this photo on the left-hand side there with the combine. Has anybody got yield mapping on their said farms? Yield mapping does not look anything like that. It's one big red blob or one big orange blob behind the back of that entire combine. How are you actually working that entire precision from the entire area from that header? Well, there's no chance. No system on this technology actually works like that. And just exactly the same with your spray systems you actually have. 36 meter boom system is just one big large blanket spray. Okay, you might have section or nozzle control. It's not really adopted at the moment and it doesn't allow you to get the resolution of what you actually want into your set field. So how can we actually break down these barriers? Okay, so conventional rates, that actually allows us to do one big blanket spray. You can break that field down into smaller sections, allowing you to actually have particular control in those areas. And then you can go down to maybe a bit blue sky and say, well, can we actually look after each plant as an individual? Just the same as you would actually work in your allotment or your garden, you'd actually want to make sure that every single plant was actually living and thriving as well as it was able to actually do. Okay, that's probably my computer just dying. Right, so, the possible futures of robotics. So, smart machines, they've been around for a while, they were called horses, so everybody was actually still working the land there, but once again, they generally involved having a person in control to enable us to actually work the field. Then along came the Industrial Revolution, we've got large fieldscape tractors and traction engines, allowing us to have traction lines to actually run through the field. That was great. Next to no compaction. Think about how all of that worked for us. They did have some problems when it got a bit muddy, though. Okay, and then we've got the old grey Fergie and everything else. And, well, I love the big John Deere here because I don't have anything like that on my farm at home. And I'm sure there's a number of you out here who've actually got a 500, 600 horsepower John Deere with duallys on, and I bet it feels absolutely amazing to drive across the land in it. But unfortunately, I don't necessarily believe that that could be the future for us. Back in the 1950s, Aldous Huxley predicted that in the year 2000, that's 18 years ago, we'd be farming remotely. So there's a chap in a nice cab with a big screen on there. He's controlling his remote control tractors. He's not getting wet. He's not getting cold. He's got a big fleet of systems actually working there. 
Now, it's 18 years later from this prediction. What the heck's gone wrong? Why are we not doing that at the moment? Well, the large companies have got the capabilities to actually do that. So, you know what? I want to break down the barrier and actually make sure we can actually do that. Here's the problems with some of those things. You can run modern farm machinery with a horse, but you still need a person behind the back of it to make it sure it's going in the right direction, especially those straight AB lines. That traction engine does get bogged down, so there's too much water in the set field. Has a problem. Back in the 1950s, radio-controlled tractors were developed, but nobody actually ever adopted them. And that big dually tractor, unfortunately, is having a bit of a problem in there. So how can we solve that? Will small vehicles with actually lower ground pressure actually allow us to actually break down this barrier and actually get into the field? Right, so this is where the nitty gritty comes into it. Golden Sachs report, which I looked up a couple of months ago, predicted that we could maybe think about solving the Methausen catastrophe that was predicted in the 1750s, where population would outgrow our ability to produce food. Now, at the moment, in the world, we're just about producing enough food if we don't exclude wastage into that set margin. There's so many thousands and millions of people around the world who are actually starving, we still produce enough food to actually work on that. However, our population is continually growing. And how are we actually enabling ourselves to actually grow enough food to actually go into the future? Well, can we solve that by actually increasing our yield capabilities by working on smaller systems that actually allow us to increase our yield by incremental amounts? So, the idea, instead of having one large 600 horsepower tractor, you can actually have about nine or 10. The idea behind all of this is that Goldman Sachs, very large um, banking company, think that there's something actually to be said in this. They're putting 65 billion pounds of understanding behind this section of market to actually say, well, you know what? Agriculture is going to change in the future. We better start thinking about how we can actually prepare for this. So we've got one $500,000 tractor system in comparison to one small tractor system that we built for $60,000. Now, I can buy a good few tractors, probably about nine for the same price as that one large system. And if I can run those together in a fleet, well, maybe we can actually start doing some interesting things to our land. So the aspects of precision farming that we were actually going to run into the hands-free hectare. So the idea that we were actually going to run on the same areas, we're going to pre-plan our waypoints, have specific AB lines, as shown on the nice yellow line there, of where the tractor would actually go. We'd pre-program a waypoint route. It would follow that every single time, following to RTK precision, allowing us to actually get one or two centimeters deviation. Could we actually do that with a very small, cheap system? OK, our combine and our tractors don't exactly have the same wheel placement. But the idea is this. If you don't have so much compaction on your main machine because it's smaller, well, you're not going to do so much damage. And do you really need to be traveling on the same tramways and traffic ways? Well, not necessarily. OK, so the set bound of the project, we had to find a field to actually work within. So the idea was to actually find a nice ring fence field, nice trees, hedges, everything around it, just in case a robot went out of control. It was going to go through a hedge, not through a housing estate or anything else like that. We wanted to make sure everything was nice and safe. And also, it was on university grounds. We mapped it out. We mapped it out very specifically to enable us to actually make sure that we had a perfect hectare within the center of it. Unfortunately, from our original plan, where we wanted to have a square, we couldn't quite manage that with our borders around the outside. So therefore, we actually had to elongate the rectangle. That worked out quite nicely, though, so it allowed us to actually have a few less passes to actually enable us to work our hectare. Oh, that's me pressing the wrong button. OK, so the hands-free hectare, we actually had our perfect hectare in the center there. We had a safety fence to go around the outside. Now, in contrary to what everybody thinks, that's so the robots don't go off and kill people. It's to make sure that the people don't go into the hectare. Surprisingly enough, if you suddenly call something a hands-free hectare, everybody wants to get into the field. So we wanted to keep all the buggers out to make sure that especially students weren't going to go and mess up with our crop. Well, it worked quite nicely. Um, we had a grass perimeter and labor list to actually just drive around and make sure we weren't going to get bogged down. And 
I wanted to be like NASA, and I wanted to have a mission control. It didn't turn out quite like a mission control, more like a caravan, but it did the same job. Okay, so this is where technology gets smart. Now, I didn't go into the full nitty-gritty of telling you how to actually make a smart tractor, because I'd probably lose a couple of you. We developed a prototype. We wanted to make sure the RTK control system of our vehicle could actually work. We put that on a radio control car. That worked nicely. Unfortunately, we were testing in the middle of the winter, so a little buggy doesn't like driving through the snow. So we had to scale it up a bit. Then we got our tractor. Our tractor is an Izeki TLA3400. It is a very small tractor in comparison to generally what's used in British agriculture. It's only 38 horsepower. It's got something unique about it, though. It's a hydrostatic drive, which means that it's actually all run on full hydraulics, allowing us to actually have one pedal to control forwards and backwards, and we didn't have to worry about gear control. That made things nice and easy for us. The other good thing is it's actually designed to actually work on grassland, allowing us to actually do really light, feathery touches to our ground and labeling it to not be damaged as we were expecting. We bought a two meter header combine. That's an old Sampo system. Yes, it's an old Sampo system. It's 25 years old. But with modern technology, you're enabling certain things to actually work as well as a brand spanking new Lexian class system as well. The control actuation was an interesting aspect. Many people thought that we would have to buy a very expensive tractor with a CAN bus control allowing us to do everything ele electronically. The idea was the other. We wanted to make sure that all agricultural machinery was able to be adjusted into our methodology. Everybody's got a tractor out there that could actually be useful for something, but hasn't necessarily got a person to sit on it. So if you can actually adapt it using linear actuators moving those same levers that you would do anyway, well, could you actually start to use it in a different method? And well, that's what we did. We put a steering motor for the control of it. We still kept the steering wheel and everything else to actually be run on the tractor normal, mainly because we had to travel across a main highway to actually get to our chemical control area, and you can't drive a robot on the highway. As much as I wanted to try, you can't. So we had to deactivate all of that, me manually drive it over to go and fill up with spray chems, and then bring back to the hectare. But the good thing is, the entire idea of the project was actually to only run the tractor in that specific area of the hectare, not solve all the problems of driverless vehicles and everything else. Surprisingly enough, I haven't got as much money as Google or Uber or anything else. So therefore, we've got to take it down a scale or two. And then our smart system was our four and a half meter sprayer. We're talking about resolution of capability. We had individual nozzle control that allowed us to actually have 50 centimeter placement of nozzles, allowing us to actually get a better targeted application of our fertilizers, our chemicals, allowing as much control as we could over the set area, breaking down the barriers of blanket coverage. Right, I don't want to lose everybody at the moment because it's going into more of different things, but the drill, the drill is not smart, not yet. This next time, next year, I'm going to make sure that a drill is smart enough to actually integrate with our tractor system. But once again, we wanted to go down modern methods of actually having minimal till, allowing us to actually not damage the ground, look after the worms, and actually do some good for us, and actually get some good soil to seed contact, enabling us to actually get good germination, considering we also did sow a spring crop. The tractor, there's our tractor. It looks rather hench with a big spray chemical tank on the front of it. Um, that was enabling us, when we did our first year of the project, to actually put nitrogen down next to the seed runs, allowing our plants to actually have as much energy as they could to actually enable them to grow. And also it worked as a nice thing of balancing out that incredibly heavy drill on the back of the system. It's a one and a half meter drill that was developed to actually work within vineyards, yet it's just been miniaturized from a system that could be seven meters wide. It's incredibly tough but it also weighs quite a lot, so we need to balance that out. But we had to use that system because everybody stopped developing small drills. All back from the 1950s where everybody had one, well, they're not existent anymore, especially direct drill, so we had to find something specific for us. Here's the actuators on the system. Remember I talked about levers and actors to actually maneuver the things? We've got our gear stick on the side there running on one actuator. 
We've got our three-point hitch running on another one there. And we've also got one at the very bottom there, which actually adjusted on our foot pedal, allowing us to go forwards and backwards. The combine was exactly the same, except, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of levers and controls on the top of it. And that big gray box on the top there controlled all the electronics that allowed us to actually actuate every single one of those in our set control. There's some rather flashy lights on the top of it, which are also our laser scanners. We had to develop a nice modern method to actually enable us to actually have a safe procedure to prevent that big munchy crunchy thing going through me. So I wanted to make sure that that nice big safety virtual fence was done by laser systems, allowing me to actually not run over anyone. And it would also stop at the fence. We developed a scout vehicle. We also had this problem of, well, you know what? If we're going to be doing all the agronomy by the groundwork, well, I can't get in there. How am I actually going to do something? Therefore, I adapted an old wheelchair that was four-wheel drive, enabled me to actually get everywhere. The ground compaction is incredibly low. The tire press is only three PSI, allowing me to actually do next to no damage to the ground. Threw on all the electronics that I'd been putting onto the tractor and put a big spade on the back, enabling me to actually go and get some samples. So... Here's the samples on the one hand side that I've actually gone and collected. And as you can see here, there's our spade mechanism going into the ground, physically taking samples across row, allowing us to actually enable us to actually get full root, full soil, and full plant growth, allowing us to actually understand the number of tillers, the number of plants we've actually got that have come up in a set area, and allow us to actually work out the flag leaf stage that actually allow us to work out when to spray. Time for we a video. We have modified our tractor with um, the autopilot from a drone. So um, they are conventionally used to plot waypoints around where you want to take your aerial photography from. Uh, we've adapted that system to control our tractor. Um, we've interfaced the human controls with actuators and the steering wheels and electric motor to convert the signals the autopilot produces to control the tractor. So far, everything's been a real team effort. We've had to have so many people just joining in, helping us out, and our sponsors have been amazing. So for the drilling, we actually had Simon from Simatech. He came down and actually calibrated our drill for us. That was something that we really appreciated getting on board with. Um, we've had Kieran from Hutchinson's doing our agronomy. He really just got involved, just helped us out, bought us fish and chips and everything. It was fantastic. Just enabled us to actually get on with things and actually understand what we needed to do. And then we've also had um, Harry from Precision Decisions setting up our spraying system for our liquid fertiliser. And that was just really useful stuff to actually set up our precision system to actually get the entire system working while we could concentrate on the tractor working autonomously. Yay! <laughs> now we've got to start thinking towards the future. The seeds in the ground, we've got to start thinking about the agronomy. How are we actually going to do that? So we've got to start thinking about using our ground rovers to actually go and drive over and give visuals for Kieran. And then also start using the drone to actually capture our multispectral imagery to actually see where the first emergence is actually going to be coming and how we're going to start treating it. After successfully drilling and rolling the crop, we had to try and turn around the tractor and reconfigure it into a sort of sprayer very quickly to try and get a pre-emergent sprayer. Sadly, we missed that target, but we have since managed to get on our T1 and T2 fungicides, including a herbicide to help tackle some grass weed we were seeing, and micronutrients to, to aid the crop growth. So chemical coming from Bayer there, and nutrients from, from Yara. So uh, that's great. The crop has done really well, it's now in ear, um, looking like it's going to yield quite well. Obviously we do have the misses where the tractor wasn't quite driving straight when we were drilling it, but I think it's going to yield reasonably well. And harvest is obviously fast approaching, so uh, work on the combine is well underway. Just in case you didn't know, it's Hands Free Hectare. It's at Free Hectare on Twitter if anybody actually wants to tweet out what I'm actually doing here today. So, just to make sure. Right. On to the main part of it. So, 
we'd managed to actually get everything running in the ground. We'd managed to automate our tractor. We'd managed to get things working correctly. But how did we actually do the agronomy? Now, I'm a drone pilot, as you might have noticed from the rather fancy drone footage that was in all of that video. Um, we wanted to make sure that we could actually get some real results from that. Therefore, the Ground Scout rover was developed to enable us to actually go and take physical samples. But where were we actually going to find those particular areas from? So I adapted a number of drone systems to actually work with me. On the side there, you can see we've got a standard red, green, blue picture just taken from a standard drone. And we've also got a multispectral image allowing us to actually understand the particular areas of the field that's thriving, not growing so well, areas that have been misses, and enabling us to actually work out, well, areas that are problems, generally things that you'd do when you're working around your land. So the drones I actually used was a old school 3DR Solo. Now, this company has gone out of business now, unfortunately, but it used all the same control systems that I was using on my tractor, enabling me to actually do all the reprogramming of this particular thing, enabling us to actually make it just like one of our swarm systems. I put a nice new Sequoia sensor on the base of it. This was a multispectral camera, enabling us to actually work out on the red edge and run through an algorithm called the NDVI, allowing us to just work out how much chlorophyll is in the plant. Generally, if a plant's living well, it'll be nice and green. If it's dying, it'll be brown and won't have so much chlorophyll in. Now, the interesting point is, you can't tell if a plant is living or dying from specific reasons from an aerial photograph. You need to get in the ground and actually understand what's going on. It could just be down to water. It could be down to a pest. It could be down to a virus. It could be down to many different reasons, but you can't tell that. Now, when I started the project, I thought I'd be able to solve everything with drones. Now, I certainly can't. Therefore, I wanted to actually make sure that everything together worked as one specific team. Phantom, I'm sure everybody's seen one of these. One of the most well-used drone systems within the agricultural market, mainly because it's so flipping cheap and does a really, really good job. They've kept on getting better and better every single year. But once again, it allows you to actually get an aerial insight to actually understand your land better than you generally would. Therefore, you can take a very nice fancy aerial photograph from that, and you can see the hectare as it's growing, misses and all. We wanted to make sure that this was an absolutely true field. We have not adjusted this. You can see the lines are wiggly. We didn't manage to solve the track to go in perfectly straight, first of all but we did manage to when we did the combine. You can see we've crushed some of our crop. You can see there's areas that are missed and everything else. But it's once again proof that if it was easy, somebody else would have done it before us. And well, once again, it was a bit of a challenge. And we talked about this multispectral imagery. Run through some analysis from the other drone system. You can see that I've put some nice fancy colors on it to actually show areas that are thriving, areas that are dying, areas that are misses, areas that are plant weeds, allowing me to actually calculate and understand variability across my land, allowing me to understand areas that I should go and have a look at. And that's exactly what I did. Pinpointing those particular areas allowed me to actually go and send that vehicle to those exact areas and find out how well those tillers in those particular areas of thriving or dying was actually going. OK. So this is where the, some science gets into it. I wanted to actually make sure that what I was actually doing had some specific precedent. Therefore, I flew over my drone every single week. I wanted to analyze how well our particular area of crop was going to grow. Now, this year, we actually grew a spring barley. That was actually planted quite late. We wanted to actually make sure we could actually understand our particular yield and understand how well our area was growing did some calculations to work it out, and I've also converted it into bushels, something I didn't even know existed until I came over here into Canada. So we estimated five tons. That's 74 bushels, whatever that is. I just typed it into Google Translate and it came up. Somebody will have to tell me exactly what a bushel is. Is it a thing? Can I grab it? I don't know. Okay. Uh, that's me pressing some button. Right. So then we also needed to actually go and do some other things within the field. Now, if you've got a crop growing, you can't send a scout rover in 
when you're actually going to do a harvest because you're going to crush all your crop. That's just daft. But I do love drones. Therefore, I developed my large S1000 drone system to have a nice big grabber on the base of it. So you know the pick the teddy out of the game um, grabber where you use a joystick, try and win a teddy bear? I did that on an industrial scale with a large drone. Unfortunately, nobody could go in the field to put a teddy bear in there, so I had to go and pick some barley instead. So what I did, this was not autonomous because it was blooming difficult to do, and I couldn't actually program anything to do this. I manually flew the drone into the field, got a snatch of the barley, brought it back, dropped it into a bucket. Did that a couple of no times, and then we ran it through a moisture meter. That allowed us to actually see if it was ready to actually be harvested or not. And lo and behold, despite the horrific weather we'd actually had this year, it was 19.9, and our threshold was 20. So yes, we were able to actually get on it and actually start working. So I was very happy indeed that my particular system was able to actually allow us to actually go harvesting. Just in case, we wanted to make sure everybody saw what we were doing, so we went on YouTube Live and Facebook Live just to actually show in real time what was actually going on. Somebody had a good old dig at my piloting, by the way. I would like to see somebody else do that. Right, okay. So to get back into it, operations. We had 10 particular applications within our field. We did a pre-seed blanket herbicide to actually kill off the area of grass beforehand. This field had actually been used as a wheat beforehand. We wanted to actually kill everything off to make sure that we actually didn't have any wheat um, volunteers in our set field. Therefore, we killed everything off. Then we planted and fertilized on the 25th of April. We rolled on the 28th of April, and then we applied a fungicide on the 5th of May. We wanted to actually make sure that everything was working correctly. We missed our T1s, unfortunately, because the weather was so good, everything sprouted in six days. That was amazing. Um, we did our PGR, plant growth regulators. We didn't want anything to lodge, mainly because we're driving an autonomous tractor. We haven't got the ability to actually lift anything, do anything else. We wanted to make sure all the crop was nice and low, allowing us to actually get it first time. With our agronomists who worked very hard to actually do this, we made sure there was no lodging, everything worked absolutely perfectly. Um, we then did micronutrients, selective herbicides, a T2 fungicides, and then a pre-harvest desiccant to kill everything off and actually make sure everything was ready to actually be harvested on a specific day. Now, as you can imagine, we didn't really want anybody to see all of this at the very beginning because we weren't very faithful of how our systems were working. However, after doing nine applications with our tractor, we got quite confident with the system. As I heard everybody chuckling that we were bought fish and chips, the particular proof that this was an autonomous system was the tractor was off drilling, I was eating fish and chips, watching the tractor go and drill. That was perfect. Considering it was raining and there's no cab on the tractor, I was very happy indeed. But we decided to actually get Sky News along to actually come and film us when we're actually doing our harvest. And hopefully, well, everything went well on the big day. The combine here has never been run in the field. We had to do everything from theory of working out A, B positions and everything else. And this is our combine for the very first time going into that line. I don't know if you can actually realize how difficult that would actually be to get going, but we're incredibly chuffed when that actually did it in front of the press, in front of the media, and just wanted to make sure it worked. And here we are, we're working the field. Nobody's on that combine harvester. Nobody's on the tractor pulling the trailer. That entire field is being harvested remotely. Nice drone footage as well, by the way. But it was a very important thing, actually, to actually have a, a drone system to be able to fly over monitor the vehicles that you couldn't actually go in the field and see and make sure everything's working correctly. However, as you might notice, the lines that we're actually running from the combine harvester are absolutely fantastic. There's one big wavy line there when we were able to try and test out the automation of our tractor trailer system. 
we did hope that we were able to get a rolling team and actually get them two together and unload on the fly. Unfortunately, uh, a main ability to actually get out of the vehicle um, involves us going through our auger. It's really quite short on our Sampo system. And it would literally involve us driving right up to it. And with any slight deviation, we'd have managed to crush our tractor and trailer. So we decided not to. That's a 25-year-old combine that's been driven autonomously. I'm still smiling now because I'm actually very proud of what I actually did. Right, okay, cool. So just to actually let everybody know, that combine is very old. It did have a lots of manual adjustments so allowing you to actually work out how well it was growing. So outside of the hectare, we actually had a particular area allowing us to actually pre-learn what the settings had to be to enable us to actually get the minimal amount of loss from our crop. So we ran the system manual. We adjusted all the systems to allow us to actually get the best settings that we believe to actually run and then we just kept with those same settings. There was no auto adjustment in the field or anything else. But you know, the large big companies have solved all those problems. We don't actually have to deal all of those. We just needed to actually prove it could actually be done by autonomous systems. Right, just to prove we did grow something for the main reason, there's our trailer of it. We had four and a half tons of barley. So that's 67 bushels to you or me. Um, we had slightly, lower amounts of actually estimated crop. We did get more volunteers than we expected from our setup. But what are we gonna do with four and a half tons of barley? Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> Beer, now that's exactly the reason. We wanted to actually make sure we could have a big party at the very end of it and actually celebrate what we actually did as our success. We want to make a hands-free beer and it's actually being through the process of actually being malted at the moment. And I know it's exactly four and a half tons because I hand loaded it into single bags, enabling it to actually go all the way to the molsters. Yes, that was quite some work. Okay, the interesting thing out of all of this in comparison to any other university project is that I've worked on so many different things that can be not talked about. They're all covered in IP, they're all with patents. I've done some really cool things with lasers. I've done really good things with bail movements. I can't say anything. However, I wanted to make sure that the world saw that agronomy and agriculture was exciting. This entire industry is kind of backwards in the understanding of how technology can actually be used to actually make our lives a little bit better. So therefore, we use social media. Social media is the new way. I can see people on their phones at the moment, tweeting, talking, everything else. Everybody's connected at the same time. And this is the amazing thing. I'm all the way over from the UK, in here in Canada, people have been following us around the world. We've had worldwide coverage from us talking about the project, warts and all, continually throughout the entire time. So we've been all the way over to Canada, South America, Russia, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. My work colleague Kit can't be here today because he's down in South Africa doing another one of these talks just to make sure everybody knows how exciting all these particular things are. It's been absolutely amazing and we're very, very privileged to actually make sure that our particular coverage has helped us actually get on and actually show how all of these things can actually be done without actually having to use some of the big large agricultural companies' technology. Social media, this needs to be updated because everybody's literally doing it. So on the 13th of November, we had over 20,000 views on uh, YouTube videos. BBC made sure that almost everybody in the UK saw it. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. We've got so many different sub subscribers, but the interesting thing is those fingers look slightly low but it's people in the know and understand things about agriculture who are really following us to actually understand what's going on. So that's really exciting to actually make sure. I even had the, um, 
Minister of Agriculture come and see me at the hectare because he had heard we'd done some really exciting things. So Michael Gove came to see me to actually talk about the hectare, to actually understand how we'd been breaking down these barriers. So, what's the future? How are we actually going to take this into the next level? Now, it's not necessarily going to be us. We wanted to show that the technology was there. We wanted to make sure it was done. So you've got Seedmaster down on the right-hand side, a nice big Canadian company um, actually working with us. After we'd actually got halfway through the project, Kubota released that they had actually got autonomous tractor systems and combine harvesters, including a rice planter, to actually work within their fields. Japan has got the same problem as agriculture all over the world, aging farming population, not old enough, to, well, too old to actually run and do work within the fields. Therefore, they need to solve that by technology. They're releasing an entire fleet. And there's another spray system over in Australia, just on the top there, the nice orange system, able to go and particularly control weeds at nozzle control, allowing us to actually get down to these main difficulties of actually reducing the amount of inputs that we're actually having, allowing us to actually gain our outputs at the other end. And drones. I love drones. I'm working particularly on actually getting drone systems to actually come in from the Asian market to actually be used to spray areas off in our fields. Now, I'm never going to necessarily say that a spray drone will actually start working the entire area of land because a drone system is not as efficient as a wheel. It does take an awful lot of energy to actually fly. But if you can target particular areas when there's a problem coming up within your field, well, that's really, really useful. You can start reducing the amount of chemicals that you're using on your field because you can go and spot spray. Now, I heard there's problems with bromes and things like that in the set areas of your fields over here. It's black grass in the UK. If you can particularly target those black grass areas and actually take all of those out with spot spraying capability, well, you've managed to save an awful lot of money and actually reduce the amount of losses that you originally had. So, what's up for us next? How are we actually doing it? So, we're continuing. We've done so much work to actually make sure that our tractor was autonomous and actually did what it said it was. And we also want to prove that it wasn't a fluke. So, what have we done? We've now planted a winter wheat. Three weeks ago, we ran the autonomous tractor all again, made sure we actually were able to plant a wheat crop within our field. Slightly different, winter wheat, we're gonna get a bigger yield, we're gonna get some really exciting things, and I'm gonna make a bread. Crop sensing, this is the interesting thing. We're gonna go more and more into depth. I've learned so much about how a drone system can actually work within agriculture. Different algorithms for understanding the multispectral imagery allows us to actually get better yield understanding and when to actually spray better. We're gonna add rolling start to our system. I can actually, well, sorry, remote start. I can actually start the tractor from a touch of a car fob. That'll be exciting. And also, I really want to make sure that we have that rolling team. I would love to have that tractor driving right next to that combine harvester unloading on the fly. That would just look flipping amazing. And then, of course, obviously what we're trying to do is increase our yield. We want to have a comparative yield in a hectare in comparison to anyone else. So where are we going to go? Maybe a hands-free farm. So if you've liked what you've seen today, because we've gone on social media, you can follow us on YouTube. You can follow us from all the other things. As I said, Twitter is at Free Hectare. Facebook, really exciting to actually show off everything. YouTube, and also, the big important thing is that we've got a website. I made the website, I make sure it's kept up to date. However, we've just recently got the new funding to actually keep us going ahead from AHDB, and I need to redo it for all this year. As soon as I actually get out of from doing all of these different things that I actually do, I'll update the website and actually make sure. But if anybody's interested, just feel free and actually get hold of me. Now, how am I doing for time? I've got videos and everything else afterwards, but would we like to actually open up the floor to questions? What I'll probably do is I'll just put a video on in the background and we can actually ask questions at the same time. Sounds, sounds good. Uh, now, if you've got a question, maybe raise your hand and, okay, we got one at the back, go ahead. Okay, 
So what? the question was on multi-spectrum sensing and Im imaging, what are you using? So. Okay, yeah, so the multi-spectral camera that I actually used on the drone system was a Sequoia sensor bought from Parrot. It has got an incandescent light sensor on the top of it that allows you to adapt to the light that's actually in the prevailing area. The main important thing is that it needs calibration every single time you actually fly, otherwise you're going to get imperfect results. So every single time you actually fly with the drone system, you need to calibrate that particular system on a calibration card in the standard light permission area that you've actually got. Therefore, after that, when you actually do your flight, the control of the light sensor will allow it to be adjusted, allowing an even spread and actually allow you to get some correct results from your flights. I know that for a fact because I got it wrong a number of times. It doesn't actually matter. Partial cloud can actually be adapted for with the incandescent light sensor. All right, any other questions? One here, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, the main problem is, right, how do you adapt open source drone control systems to actually drive a ground rover perfectly straight? Now, nobody had ever actually run through the system in such controlled environments. Now, we'd known the system was possible. A gentleman called Matthew, Matthew Rema from over here in Canada had actually developed the system and actually used it to be his chaser bin to actually drive the tractor and take it all the way back to his farm site. But the problem was, nobody had ever done actually some analysis to actually see how straight was straight. Is it going to be as straight as the standard AB line from a um, John Deere system or Case New Holland? Well, no, it wasn't. And there's a number of reasons that it actually wasn't like that. We had to go into the code specifically to understand how it could be adjusted to enable it to work better. Drone system and open source code was certainly not designed to actually enable us to actually get a very straight line. Therefore, what we did, we adapted it, and by the time we actually went through to the combine harvester, we'd actually managed to solve those particular problems, enabling us to actually get to work and actually get a very good straight line. What do you see you know, from what you've already learned as one of the big challenges in adapting what you've tried in a hectare into a bigger field? You know, what, are, what do you see as a couple of the barriers? You know, we've got bigger fields than just a single hectare here. What would you see as a couple of the real challenges or stumbling blocks to, to get us to a hands-free farm? Um, well, I don't know about over here in Canada. It's certainly a case within the UK in the rural areas. It's communication. You need decent communication to actually talk to the vehicle, to the mission control from one vehicle to another, actually make sure that continuity actually keeps together. That's the big problem that we're actually having at the moment. So even with our, our hectare, we'd have Wi-Fi coverage to actually control that particular area. And we'd done scouting and working out to actually see if we could get enough control signal from one side to the other. The big thing is if you can start getting satellite or mobile communication to actually work and talk to these vehicles, enabling you to actually go into a further and further widespread capability. And that's areas that we're actually looking into to actually get partners to actually provide those particular systems to enable us to actually go further. As soon as we've got that, we've got things nailed. Great, okay, I think we've got time for one last question. Is there anybody? The good news is uh, Jonathan is going to be around here for the two days of the conference, so you can uh, uh, grab him at a coffee break and talk with him more in depth on, on some of the machinery and such. But uh, at this time, we'd really like to thank you, Jonathan, for expanding our horizons and telling us all about Hands Free Hectare. Let's give him a big round of applause.